Okay, hello everyone. Thank you all for coming out here tonight. My name is Julia. I use they them pronouns and I'm on the events team here at Books or Magic. Before we get started with the event, I do just want to share a few quick logistics. First off, we do ask that you keep your mask on and covering both your mouth and nose throughout the duration of this event. Secondly, we're going to be doing a hand-raised audience Q&A toward the end of the event, so start thinking of questions to ask and then hang on to them. After the talk tonight, Michelle is going to be signing and personalizing books at the desk all the way at the back of the store, and we will have additional books available to purchase up at the register where you came in. And if you're joining us virtually on the YouTube live stream, we'd love to encourage you to buy a copy of We Do What We Do in the Dark online. You can use the link in the live stream description to do so. Okay, with all of that out of the way, I'm very excited to introduce Michelle Hart and Emily Gould, who are here tonight celebrating the release of Michelle's new novel, We Do What We Do in the Dark. Dark is an incredible debut and it follows Mallory, a college freshman who starts up a passionate affair with the woman, a professor at her school. Mallory throws herself into the relationship using it as a vehicle to process both her grief and her sexuality. Michelle's prose is haunting and poetic and it explores power, desire, and more. We Do What We Do in the Dark is equal parts sensual, sensual literary novel and unputdownable page turner, and we are so, so excited to be able to celebrate it with you all tonight. Michelle Hart is the assistant books editor at O, oh, the Oprah magazine. Her fiction has appeared in Joyland and Electric Literature, and she has written nonfiction for Catapult, Nylon, The Rumpus, and The New Yorker Online. She received her MFA in fiction from Rutgers University, Newark. And as I mentioned, Michelle is joined in conversation tonight by Emily Gould. Emily is the author of And the Heart Says Whatever, Friendship and Perfect Tunes, which is out now in paperback. With Ruth Curry, she founded Emily Books, an online bookstore and imprint of Co Coffee House Press. So without further ado, everyone, please give a very warm welcome to Michelle and Emily. Oh, um, Michelle is going to read from her book. Thank you. Thank you guys for coming. It means a lot. I'll start from, by reading the first few pages, um, including some of the stuff that happened when, uh, you know, the descriptions of college. So a lot of you, that's where I met you guys. So <laughs> hopefully it'll be resonant. When Mallory was in college, she had an affair with a woman twice her age. When the woman was 17, she herself had had an affair with a man in his 40s. Mallory admired the woman so much that for many years, any similarity between them flattered her. Mallory had run on the treadmill behind the woman at the university's gym for weeks before they actually met. It was September of her freshman year. Mallory, whose mother had died months before, had become haunted by the prospect of poor health. Also, she was a first-year student and worried about letting something free, like a gym membership, go to waste. The school's main gym was in the midst of renovations. A crude, makeshift workout area now occupied one half the intramural basketball court. This was separated from the other half by a large mesh curtain. The treadmills and weightlifting equipment were laid atop a foundation of cardboard flooring so as not to scruff the hardwood underneath. It was a squalid, airless space, almost like a hospital, with nowhere pleasing to look. Mallory felt drawn to the woman the first time she saw her. The woman had walked into the gym wearing a loose-fitting tank top so slack it billowed as she moved. She carried an alluring sadness about her, with dark pouches under her eyes that seemed to hold a lot of weariness and wisdom. The woman's facial expression dramatized the solitude Mallory herself felt inside. The woman wore it well, and as her shirt lifted from her body, Mallory saw the woman's melancholy as an invitation, a shared space for the two of them. 
Tied to the woman's wrist was a small folded towel, and when the woman stepped onto the treadmill, she unwound it, draping it over the machine's control panel so the buttons and the time were hidden. She worked out on her own internal clock, without headphones, intensely focused and free of distraction. As the woman ran, Mallory looked from her shoulder blades, which her mother had called wings, to her ass. The woman had a body that was taut and muscular. It was the kind of body that seemed like it would never be stricken by illness. The woman, Mallory learned, went to the gym at the same time every day. She ran three miles in 24 minutes. In that period, Mallory could hardly run too, but she found watching the woman made the time tick heedlessly. Seeing how fit the woman was, Mallory began to eat healthier. Instead of a bagel at breakfast, she had a banana or some yogurt. Instead of a sandwich for lunch, she ate a salad. By the end of her first month away at school, she burned off most of the baby fat she still carried with her. After 18 years of avoiding her reflection or else being preoccupied by its abject homeliness, she now stood for long, surreptitious spells in front of the mirror in the communal bathroom with her shirt hiked up. The university Mallory attended was on Long Island. The campus, a 45-minute train ride from Manhattan, lay between two towns, one said to be seedy, the other considered posh. The bad part had the bars, where some of the students went on weekends since they were within walking distance. The good, which was harder to access without a car, had the manicured lawns of the professor's homes. The college was mostly a commuter school, and on nights and weekends, it was as if two-thirds of the students simply vanished, like the rapture. Lacking both a car and an interest in bars, Mallory felt at once claustrophobic and isolated, a feeling with which she'd been familiar for most of her life. She'd hoped college would be different. Her body vibrated with potential energy. But walking to and from her classes, she saw the sprawling campus as indifferent to her. She had the perpetual feeling of sneezing without being blessed. Other than her roommate, whose name was Joy, Mallory hadn't made any new friends. Together, their dorm room was a pair of Greek theater masks, Joy on one side, Mallory on the other. <laughs> Joy had come to the college to study drama. She had the looks and the disposition for acting. Many things she did seemed dramatic. When she spoke or ate, she obscured her mouth with the back of her hand. When she read, she sometimes shut the book and bit into its jacket. When she watched shows on her laptop, she blinked rapidly and forcefully as if she was wincing or willing something into happening, like Barbara Eden and I Dream of Jeannie. <laughs> Joy had spent most of their first few weeks at school preparing to audition for the school's play. She, she rehearsed monologues from Shakespeare and her favorite films. Some of these she performed for Mallory, but she didn't get a part. This devastated her, and for days after her audition, she became withdrawn. During this time, Mallory felt embarrassed on both of their behalf. The humiliation of a ruined dream was too acute, and Mallory felt incapable of consoling her. Time passed, however, and Joy declared that the following semester she would study pre-law. The courtroom was a different kind of theater, she said, and one that paid much better. Her tossing aside an old life so easily brought Mallory comfort. A new one might be waiting for her, too. So I just wanted to say, Michelle, it's an honor to be here to celebrate this event with you. I really, um, I'm just, it makes me so happy and so excited and honestly so moved that people are, so many people are about to read this book and it's so great. It's like so great for them. It's so great for you. Like, it's great for all of us. It's, it's, we need a win right now. <laughs> you know, it's nice to have a thing that it feels totally good that we can celebrate and it's a wonderful really really special new book coming into the thank world so. that means a lot coming from you so well, thank you i a million percent need it okay so i thought i would start with um craft stuff and then sort of like segue um gracefully into career stuff okay um <laughs> because i know that's what people are really interested in <laughs> um I wondered when I was reading this book a little bit about um, your choice to um, have it be in third person. Did it start out that way? Was it always that way? And how were you thinking about that choice? Yeah. 
Very crafty question, I guess. The craftiest. Um, yeah, I had written drafts in the first person. You know, the, the book is fairly autobiographical in places, um, you know, at least in terms of sensibility and, and especially the, the stuff that happens in Mallory's childhood is very reminiscent of what happened in my childhood. Um, you know, so like the, the impulse, of course, is to write it in first person. Um, and there were just sort of, um, I found that there was, it didn't afford me distance from the character, right? Like, I, as, at the end of the day, I'm writing a fictional character. And so that third person became really, really necessary. And also, um, at, a, at a very craft level, um, I think that the, the difference for me between first and third person is that um, third person burns plot at a more rapid rate, I think. Um, because when, you, when you're writing in first person, you're often, you know, um, the stakes are kind of inherently higher because what's happening is happening to a, a, an eye, right? A consciousness that the a direct consciousness in the book, and and when you're in third person, you know, um, it, it kind of eliminates the the need for sort of excessive uh, interiority, which is something that um, I find that I get tripped up on in other people's books, just sort of like you know endless interiority and processing, and and ultimately it left no room for the reader. So yeah, so there were. Um, Oh, did that answer it? <laughs> Amazingly. <laughs> nailed it. Yes. No, I I mean, it's something that I think about a lot. Yeah. Um, I wondered about your influences. Um, there, there are certainly books that are thematically similar and books that are structurally similar a little bit but I I was I was actually genuinely curious whether you felt that any specific books were informing this book or or maybe you, or maybe were there any books that you were even writing against mm. <laughs> anti anti influences um, yeah. I don't know about that um I mean yeah there's um to me, when I read this book, you know, all I can see is its influence <laughs> in some ways. But, um, you know, there's there's a lot of Garth Greenwell in the book. Um, his book, if you if you aren't familiar, What Belongs to You, um, has a kind of similar three act structure where, you know, the first person, the, the first section takes place in the present and then the second plate, the second section sort of flashes back. And, and, and I really and and sort of taking that structure really helped me figure out um what the book's center of gravity is uh, for, for my book um so and, i mean he's just a very good writer of queer desire too and 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 his sentences are beautiful um so there's that there was um lisa holiday's asymmetry um which i've never read a philip roth novel and i never have any interest in reading I'm a sorry. Philip Roth novel. i'm sorry what <laughs> no yeah. Come on. sorry yeah oh, um, no. i know it's just just, just Seriously, I'm gonna buy you Goodbye Columbus. It, it, it will take you 45 minutes. It's yeah. really short. It's like, I, I feel like, don't deny yourself pleasure because yes. of like the things around it. You know, like, mm -hmm. no, it, it has nothing to do with with sort of the. You live, extra... in, New, you live in New Jersey. <laughs> it's like I went to school in Newark. The Bard of Newark. Come on. Oh, maybe it's. Oh, maybe this is like a. It's too close for. Uh, I mean, yeah, I guess a Jew from New who went to school in Newark, right? right. Well, we'll, um, we'll, we'll work through this in therapy, but like, you know. Um, yeah. So, but you were saying. But no, asymmetry, you know, which if you don't know, is sort of a lightly fictionalized version of Lisa Halliday's relationship with, with Philip Roth. And, and, and I feel like I, I got close enough to Philip Roth reading that book that <laughs> I feel like I don't, I don't need It's like to. the worst possible introduction to Philip Roth. <laughs> like, encounter Philip Roth as, like, the fictional, horny, like, 23-year-old Philip Roth first, and not the, like, disgusting, elderly, baseball-obsessed, uh, like, Philip Roth who 
buys an ice cream cone for like a young nubile <laughs> Lisa Holiday's stand it. Anyway, oh, sorry, we're getting distracted here. <laughs> but no, but I mean that certainly that book has an interesting structure and it plays around with its its formative relationship in a way that um, you know even when the relationship isn't center stage, like it's sort of in the back of reader's mind and and that taking that format of it was was really helpful. Um, and then I guess like the really obvious one and, and, and you know, here's where being a bookseller has kind of complicated my, my understanding of it. Um, I just really like Sally Rooney. I know, that, I know that that's not cool to admit at this point anymore. Um, but I think that she, that she writes in a, a very economical way that I find really pleasing. Um, you know, that I, I think that there are very few writers who are as good as her as at, at writing two people in a room together, you know, and, and the kind of weird magic that happens. Um, so, you know, yeah, I guess as far as influences, that would, that would cover the bases. Oh, I mean, I I thought of, so, do you care? <laughs> what I, mean? yeah. my, I, I was thinking about um, my education. Okay. Did you? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. I won't say anything about it. <laughs> Okay, that'll be off the record. Um, but then, but then also, um, uh, Sombre Susan no. by Sigrid Nunez. No. Um, just, just in terms of it's a um, well, that's a memoir, so it's totally not fair comparison. But it's a buildings buildings roman that's not about a formative sexual relationship but it is about like a formative relationship with like sort of an older woman mentor that like warps you and makes you in equal measure highly recommended actually okay, yeah <laughs> um but i should i should say what when when i sort of have that jive about the book editor thing um and i told this to claire my publicist and um, but whenever I was pitched a book that was about like a 20 something girl, a millennial, it would always be like, this is in the vein of Sally Rooney. Mm -hmm. And so I got conditioned to like any time a book was like in the vein of Sally Rooney, I knew I wouldn't like it. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's funny because a couple of the reviews that come out about the book, you know, say, oh, this is sort of like Sally Rooney. <laughs> um, and it's just kind of like, oh. but like I, you know, it's, it's what I was influenced by. So, but it's just sort of me being like, ah, oh, when you, when you compare something, uh, you you so off, you so rarely come out favorable. Um, but it feels it can feel really um, minimalizing or insulting too, because of course you're like, I'm the one special me, and <laughs> and also, and also it's, it's like oh, if they're comparing me to this thing and people are expecting this thing and then they take a bite of it and it's like, you know, steak tartare when they're expecting like a cupcake, they're going to be disappointed. Um, but steak tartare is very delicious. Mm -hmm. but, but not if you're expecting a cupcake. Mm -hmm. That's true. Um, I guess we're getting to career stuff a little earlier <laughs> than I had planned, but it seems sure. like it's just happening and I'm not going to fight it. Um, it's got to be really tough to be professionally reading um, and then also writing a novel. How, how, what, what, backing up a little bit and making it more specific, what was the hardest part about writing this book? I'm a, I'm a very impressionable writer, so I think the hardest part of, of, of doing my job at, at the same time as writing a book was to try to block out other people's work um, and, and try to keep it out of my own um, in terms of voice, especially, you know, like um, it's a, it's voice is so hard to capture, like, you know, um, but, but, you know, and so I would be so influenced if I read, if I read a book that had like a really compelling narrative voice, I would sort of be like, Oh, I can, I can channel that. I can write about that. Um, so, you know, this, this book took me 10 years. I wasn't just writing it while I was at, um, at, Oh, and so, um, my, my narrative voice changed a lot over those, over that decade. Um, and so add in the extra influence of, of reading, you know, people like Raven Leilani, right. Or who has a very distinct style, um, who, you know, I was just like, Oh my God, I would love to write like that, you know, and, and, and sort of stuff like that. Um, but, uh, I mean, the hardest part honestly was, was time, um, finding, finding the, when you, when you, 
when you read and write for a living, um, it's hard to go do it for fun. Um, and, you know, so there were, I was writing a lot of, a lot of stuff, um, you know, in Gmail drafts uh, while I was at work, um, you know, when, when inspiration struck, you know, I, I did a lot of writing, um, waiting in line for port, for the bus at Port Authority. Um, you know, I was like writing sex scenes, like in line, sort of look, <laughs> looking back and be like, oh, hope, hope, hope the person behind me doesn't see that. Um, you know, so, but ultimately I think it worked out uh, because, um, you know, the, the book is very much about relationships of stolen moments, right? And so it made a kind of sense then to have, um, you know, a writing style that was almost like stolen moments, right? Where I was just sort of at every, every chance that I could get a, a second to, to write a scene or to write some dialogue, I would, I would take it. Um, but, it, you know, it's hard to sustain that over a long period of time, but yeah. What does Oprah smell like? Does she smell amazing? <laughs> I have no idea. Um, <laughs> you signed an NDA. <laughs> um, Oprah is hilarious. Uh, the, the, thing, the thing that I didn't realize about Oprah that um, working for her made me realize was that she's very sarcastic and funny and like dr very dryly funny, um, which is not, I guess, not something that like, public facing person I mean like maybe now a lot of people sort of see her as, as sort of that way um but I was just really taken aback by you know how how um sort of dryly funny she was um so that was kind of cool I don't know if that speaks to the smell I, would, of her. I, would, I was just trying to get at something uh visceral and <laughs> personal but I don't know why it smell was the, 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 into mine. <laughs> the first time I met her um she sort of did this like look me up and down thing and she said isn't it nice to get paid to read books for a living <laughs> um and she said it with that sort of dry tone and I was like yes thank you <laughs> take it all right take it right yeah, yeah. um do you um, do you feel done with this book? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, like I said, you know, I've been working on this thing for for a decade. Like it's it's um, uh, you know, a lot of my friends are having kids now, and 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 I always resist the urge to be like, me too. <laughs> <laughs> it took ten years, it only took you nine months. Um, <laughs> But, you know, like, yeah, it's, it's been with me for a while. Um, just the story and the characters and, and the message of the book and, and, and the voice of the book, you know, Mallory has a very specific, to me at least, um, sensibility that um, I just, I can't wait to not have anymore. <laughs> I know that sounds really bad, but I just, um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Is that how you feel when you end a book? Do you do you sort of like I'm um, done with these people? I I don't even remember what writing book is like. So yeah, sure. <laughs> but like, uh, I mean, I guess I, I guess I must be just simply thinking about people who have um, revisited like characters and situations in in different novels, even with like a break in between to do different things over the years. Like, I don't know you. Have you already started working on the next book? Yeah. Yeah. Is it a million percent different and has like dragons in it or something? <laughs> um, I hope so, for your sake. <laughs> no, no. I mean, um, ultimately, um, and, uh, here, I'll, I'll cite Sally Rooney. I, want, I interviewed her when I was, when, uh, when one of the things that she said that sort of struck me was um, that she described herself as imaginatively limited, um, but she sort of, um, didn't mean, I guess she meant that as a knock against herself, but she also meant that as kind of like a modus operandi, right? Like that's kind of, she, she, she has a specific story that she is good at telling, um, and she tells that story. Um, I guess that's kind of Rothian, right? I don't, I don't <laughs> pretend to know <laughs> that much, but it seems to me that Philip Roth kind of wrote the same story over and over again. But then broke free of it. And in 
you know, like mid career and started doing something totally different. I'll take your word for it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, wow, I who would have expected me as the <laughs> number one fan and defender of the honor of <laughs> Sorry to put you in that position. Ghost of Philip Roth. <laughs> Exit, ghost. Um, okay, so um, I think we should open up it up to questions that are not my questions. Are, are we ready to yeah, do sure. that? Okay. Yeah, right. um, Oh, and we and we have one already. And I and I'm gonna um, for the live stream reiterate your question after you ask it. It's gonna seem weird to us in the room, but it's not gonna seem weird to people on the live stream. Um, hi, congratulations. Thank you. Have the real thing. I heard it very very early on, um, and so it looks bad. Uh, my question is, you know, uh, lesbian literature is a sort of emerging uh, genre now, and how do you navigate pitching this book? Um, and also fighting being pigeonholed, uh, you know, mm -hmm. to a certain audience. I mean, because I've read the Times Review, it seems like it's universal theme for everyone. And how did you um, escape uh, pigeonholing as the lesbian book, the you know LGBTQ author? Yeah. So, um, sorry, just to reiterate really fast for the folks watching at home, um, how do you escape being pigeonholed as a queer author? Starting with a softball. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure that it's an act, uh, an active kind of avoidance. Um, it's, I can't help it. <laughs> you know, that is the writer that I am, you know, um, that is the character that I'm writing. Um, and so, you know, I, I never once in the process uh, of writing it was I worried that, oh my God, only lesbians are going to read this, right? Um, or uh, you just can't sort of let yourself think that that's, I mean, even though it could possibly be true, <laughs> um, you know, you just can't sort of trick yourself into thinking that. And I think, you know, um, to to tap into one of, one of the things that you said in your question, I think ultimately that... Um, that universality is found in the specifics, right? And and so it doesn't necessarily matter like about the, the sexuality of the character, but it is it does matter for that character. Um, and you know if I can tell a true story about that character and and then it'll resonate with somebody who doesn't share that identity, hopefully. Um, so yeah, so I, 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 as far as being as escaping it, um, I don't know. I I I wasn't really conscious of doing that, you know. And I had a I had a really great team working on the book that never made it seem like it was this is just a queer book and that's it, you know. That it, there there was, um, you know, it was it was just a book, not a queer book, but it is a queer book, right? But it's just it's not the thing, I guess. Well, that's that's great that you have that team and that's the goal. That's yeah. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Hi. Um, Hi, Iris. I was wondering if you consider Mallory a protagonist. The question is, does Michelle consider Mallory a protagonist? Like, like a heroine? Like a, like a, um, yeah, you know, um, yeah, I think, I think that, this story definitely could have been told in such a way that it would alternate between the two people's perspective, right? Um, and that's what a, a traditional sort of maybe like a romance novel would do. And and there are parts of parts of the book that feel romance novel-y. Um, but I think that ultimately I wanted to keep the perspective with Mallory, um, you know, because she's at that age where we're all super solipsistic, right? We're, we just think about ourselves all the time and, and the story that we're living is the only story, right? And, and, and um, it's, it's sort of, you know, it's, it's about that, that that's, uh, she, she definitely thinks of herself as a protagonist, right? Um, <laughs> not just me thinking of her that way. Um, and I think, yeah, so uh, does that answer your question? <laughs> yes. Um, so my question is, Michelle, you said you've been working on this for like 10 years or so. And so the book becomes a lot of different drafts over that time. But what I'm curious about is if you could expand a little more on what was happening for you creatively, you know, personally, spiritually, whatever. <laughs> At what point that the draft that became a rep the recognizable version of the book that we're all holding 
like started to click into place. Yeah, I mean, sorry, no, I have to. Um, uh, you have become a different person creatively, spiritually, and emotionally over the course of the past 10 years. At what point did the draft that became the book that we're currently holding click into place? Um, I mean, here I have to shout out Sarah Burns, my agent, um, who has been with me since the very beginning. Um, and, you know, I sent, I sent the, I think the first draft that I sent you uh, was, was nothing like this, right? It was, um, to use your phrase, it wasn't a real book yet. Um, but you ended up being correct, you know, and, and yeah, so, you know, over 10 years, um, a, a lot has happened, like, in the world, um, you know, and to me especially, you know, I started writing the book when I was in college, so the stuff that I was writing was very focused on, you know, a, a, a person like me in college and, and what that's like. Um, and then, you know, I, I exited school and I was living in the real world. Um, and so, you know, um, that obviously changed a lot of the story that I was telling that, you know, now that, uh, so what, what would happen if I put this character in the real world now? Um, but also, you know, like a nostalgic part of me was, well, I, I kind of want to go back to college. Um, you know, like now that I'm in the real world, can I go back, please? Um, and then, you know, a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff happened. And then, um, you know, uh, I, I was about two thirds way done the book and, and the Me Too movement happened. Um, and, um, you know, I had written a lot of this story about this, this, this um, relationship that had very specific power dynamics. Um, and the Me Too movement, and one of the things that the Me Too movement does, uh, did, or still doing, that I find really compelling is this recontextualization of, relation, of past relationships, right? And so, that became that that didn't really change the story that I was writing, but it clarified for me the stakes of the story that I was telling. Um, and it, it 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 also became pretty hard to like not incorporate that into the book somehow. Um, like it, to to do that would be totally ignorant and eliding that that part of it. Um, so yeah, so in terms of just sort of like the different drafts, um, it, it, the, the stakes for me changed each time I, I went down, uh, went, went to sit down and write the book. The question is, were you hyper aware as a former books editor at O Magazine of what the reviews of your debut novel, what might be like? Um, I would have driven myself insane if I had thought about that, honestly. Um, I, I, for a lot, for, you know, and part of the, part of what was kind of fun about writing the early drafts of the book is that I didn't really think that anybody would read it. Um, so I just kind of wrote what the story that I wanted to tell. And I, I think that like a lot of people tell you to write the story that you want to read. And for a long time, I thought that that was kind of bullshit. Like that's just sort of like writing like mumbo jumbo that people tend to say, but it absolutely is true. You know, I, I, um, at, at every stage of this process, I, I just kept writing the book that I would want to read that I didn't see uh, in the world. And, you know, to ask, to answer your question, Gina, um, you know, um, what sort of sustained me over a long enough period of time was the belief that this, this was a story worth telling, right? Um, and so, yeah, um, in terms of reception, I, I almost, I, I had to put that out of my head. Um, I think one of the things that I, I will, I will complicate that by saying um, a, a fun thing that people do is take um, screenshots of digital versions of, of books and post them on Twitter and Instagram. And I think I was definitely, uh, especially towards the later stages of revision, was very conscious about writing a sentence cool enough for somebody to do that. <laughs> um, so, like, if somebody out there wants to take a screenshot of a sentence that I wrote, that would be really cool. Right on. Okay, I have a few in mind. 
Um, earlier when you were talking about um, being able to craft your voice, um, what was the process that you went through to be able to identify that and really like sharpen and hone? How did you sharp find and then sharpen your voice? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. Um, and uh, I'm trying to find a more a compelling answer than black magic. Um, but honestly, um, it was just sort of a lot of it happened in revision. Um, you know, I, I would where I would sit down and just sort of I could easily identify which clauses in a sentence were were inspired by something else that I read. And so it was a matter of saying that's not that's not genuine. That's not from you. Um, uh, also, you know, it was a, the, the book, I hope, is very imagistic. Like there's a lot of metaphor and there's a lot of um, a visual component to the book. And um, a lot of that was sort of about um Listen, like not letting myself use images that Mallory, the character, wouldn't come up with, right? So to sort of, to, to remove my own writerly inclinations and just let the character kind of guide and, and speak for uh, the book. Um, so, you know, um, ultimately um, that was kind of the process of, of refining the voice to just make sure it was not true to me so much as it was true to Mallory. Um, I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> um, best piece of writing advice you ever gotten from someone who wasn't your favorite Best piece of writing advice you've ever gotten? Favorite piece of writing advice to give? Um, oof. Writing advice that I've gotten. Um, I think in a perverse way, um, my my mentor, Akhil Sharma, um, has this thing that he says about story, uh, fiction writing that he says, the reader is not your friend. And I know that, <laughs> and I know that that's kind of like not a fun, like a nice thing to say. Um, the way that he means it is, is that, you know, a, a, a writer, a reader is sort of, um, their attention is so, wanting to go elsewhere that it it's 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 your job as a writer to sort of home them in right to to sort of you know make them pay attention to make them snap to attention um and so that's totally you know one of the things that's changed the way that I write you know if if I'm reading something back to myself and I find my my attention drifting elsewhere I know that that's going to happen doubly for someone who doesn't give a shit about the book. Um, you know, so uh, that kind of advice is, is I find, very, very helpful. Um, so I would also give it, <laughs> I guess, uh, in a weird way, you know, to, to, to um, you know, make sure that, that um, and, and different writers can do different, you know, like my, my thing in writing is sort of short sentences and short paragraphs. And that's why, that's how I manage to try to keep the reader's attention. But there are writers like Garth Greenwell, for instance, or Raven Leilani, who can write really, really long sentences and long paragraphs that still manage to hold the reader's attention because their language is so virtuosic and surprising. Um, you know, so yeah. I guess I would. Oh, um, I didn't see who was first. Oh, sorry. Um, in the in the plaid, sir. About long time fan, Michelle. Uh, my question for you is, since the character of Mallory has, you know, some similarities to your own history, did you have to consciously? make decisions to separate yourself from the character or did you find that it was easy to you know make decisions that that really had you you know had it not be a complete self-insert oh so the question is um how did you keep mallory from being you <laughs> Um, yeah, you know, one of the fun things about writing fiction and, and writing, for me, writing Mallory was she, she is in some senses weirder than I am and, and in, in a big sense, um, <laughs> are you saying that I'm weird then? <laughs> um, uh, you know, she, the biggest thing is that she's not afraid to do the weird thing. 
the big weird thing, right? Um, she's a much more, I think, active character than I am. You know, she find like, you know, in the, in the very beginning of the book, she follows the woman into the restroom. Um, it's not something that I would do, <laughs> um, you know? Uh, so she, she continually makes decisions um, that are like the big weird decisions that I think that I just wouldn't do. And I think that that uh, helped the separation a lot where, you know, I'm a much more introspective, introverted, you know, sort of um, fearful person. Um, and I was writing somebody who, you know, kind of had a lot of the same, same hangups as I did, but who, who wouldn't be afraid in certain situations that I would be afraid in. Um, and so that ultimately helped kind of, but ultimately, what was fun was was using my own sensibility to sort of justify the things that she was doing, right? And so ultimately, there had to be that that psychological um, naturalism and that realism. Um, but yeah, I think the biggest thing is that just Mallory was like not afraid to do the, the big weird thing. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Inspired by your love for Sally Rooney, if this uh, book got turned into a TV show for Hulu, would you want to play? <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's cast the mini series. Go. Um, you you thought about it. <laughs> of course, I thought about it. Um, I think the the I think I've only ever had one actress in mind for Mallory, um, and her name is Caitlin Deaver. Um, she she was in Booksmart. She was in Justified. Um, she has this sort of um, almost tomboyish thing to her, um, but and she also was one of those actresses that could like very easily play teenager. But I've also seen her in roles where she's like a single mom, like in her thirties, right? And so you would need somebody who. You know, the book spans, you know, essentially 10 years in this girl's life and from a teenager to 27 year old. Um, and so you would need somebody who could sort of you know, plausibly play that age group. And, and Caitlin Deaver is her for me. What about the professor? <laughs> Kate Blanchett? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, Candace, my girlfriend, and I argue about this all the time. Um, <laughs> Kate Blanchett would be like the really easy answer, right? But Come on. <laughs> I, I just, um, I don't, I don't think, I don't see it. Um, maybe Kate Winslet. She's a very talented actor. She is a very talented actor. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I mean, she's she's great, and she's she's also very good at playing, like, ugly pretty, um, which is kind of how I imagine the woman. Like, she's not like the, like, she's not like Kate Blanchett, like, well put together, right? Um, she's but, mare. She's mare. <laughs> she's not quite, like... German mare. <laughs> she's not quite, like, wah-wah and yingling, right? Um, but... Um, uh, Kate Winslet, I think, um, Jillian Anderson, I think, would be good, um, especially uh, as a blonde, I think, uh, blonde Scully. Um, I could just list it, actresses that I'm really attracted to, uh, but I guess, like, that would be kind of weird for everybody. We got time. <laughs> Later. All right, um, I think we have time for maybe one more. And then let's then we'll go sh schmooze a bit, and then um, Michelle's gonna sign all y'all's books. Okay, so one last question. I already asked the question, so yeah. all right. uh, mine was does don't tell me it because I don't want to know. But does the woman have a name to you? <laughs> no. Does the woman have a secret private name that is known only to you, other than the woman? <sighs> Yes and no. Um, it, like, yes, in the sense that when I was writing the book, um, she had various different different names. And there was ultimately one where I was like, OK, like I can I can see that being her name. Um, but no, in the sense that after I named her that privately, I just I just didn't think it worked. Um, so like, yes, I had a name that won out above all the other names. Um, but no, uh, pretty, pretty soon after I thought of that name, I was like, I don't, she doesn't have a name. <laughs> like Astrid. 
Gretel. Gretel? <laughs> Hannah. Okay, sorry. Um, the end. <laughs> um, thank you guys all so much for coming out for this. Um, and congratulations thank again, you. Michelle. Thank you. Thank you, thank you guys. to everyone for being here. As a reminder, Michelle is going to be signing at that back desk all the way here, but let's give her a moment to get settled. Um, and you are going to be able to purchase additional copies of We Do What We Do in the Dark, as well as Emily's book, Perfect Tunes. That's going to be up at the front where you checked in. If you're still on YouTube with us, you can find the link to purchase those books in the description. And if you're in store with us, we do ask that once you've gotten your copies from up here, you do make your way downstairs so our staff can begin to break down this space. And we'll unlock that back door so that you can exit through there. That's all for me. Thank you again, everyone. And let's give these two one last round of applause. <laughs>